everybody, I'm Sarah and I'm a recorder player. Hello, I'm Emily and I'm a flute player. Welcome back to Team Recorder. This week, I am here with no one other than Emily Bynan, principal flute player of the Concertgebouw Orchestra. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> this is the latest instalment in my series about how to play a particular style of music. Today, we're getting into the classical period. First of all, welcome, Emily. Thank you. Thank you for being here. My pleasure. I'm very excited to get into classical music. Yeah, great, great era for the flute. Yeah, yeah not so great era for the recorder. The flute was uh, taking over the recorder a bit at this point. Well, Frederick the Great, you see, played the flute. So, so he, you know, that sort of started a whole fashion, I think, of and what men, you... usually. Really? Yes, it wasn't the ladies, no. Nothing as vulgar as uh, blowing into an instrument was... Uh... Oh yeah, I, I can see that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so what year will we be talking about? I suppose we're talking 1750, 1820. That's interesting because we often say that the Baroque period ends with the death of Bach in 1750. And that's when we kind of think of the recorder as falling out of favour. Of course, right. it wasn't as immediate as that. Well, that's the thing, you know, fashions, it's not like they had Instagram or anything to keep up to date or anything. So <laughs> exactly. fashions took quite a while to, you know, travelling took so long, longer for those fashions to filter through and to spread, I suppose. I also want to say before we start, this is quite interesting because as a recorder player, I'm approaching the classical period coming out of the Baroque. But I guess as an orchestral flute player, you could be approaching it from the other way, from romantic music, from exactly. 20th century. Yes. We're kind of meeting in the middle. I mean, in the orchestra, we play everything from every year. We do a Matthew Passion or a John Passion, right up to ink still wet contemporary music and everything in between. But I suppose our core repertoire would be the Brahms symphonies, the Beethoven symphonies, the Tchaikovsky symphonies, you know, that's from early romantic right through to late romantic. So when I look to play Mozart, um, I have to sort of get rid of that thick sound, all those sung through slurs that might be appropriate in a Brahms symphony, for example, or Tchaikovsky. Okay. Um, and be very careful about use of vibrato rather than putting it like a cream on everything or sugar <laughs> on everything. <laughs> It just needs to be really thought of as being more in the direction of an ornament, I think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, as something that you add to a certain note to bring out something special. Right, yeah, that's how that's... we would say it in the Baroque as well. It's yeah. not so much an integral part of the sound, but mm -hmm. it's an embellishment. Yes. Could you introduce your instruments? Yes, well, I've brought three flutes with me today. This is a copy of a Quance flute. So it's got a D sharp key and an E flat key. On most Baroque flutes, it would be one key. The classical flute was probably closer to this than the modern flute in the sense of it maybe had four keys or six keys, mm -hmm. but it would have had a slightly narrower bore perhaps mm -hmm. than a, a traverso. So that's the, the instrument that Mozart probably would have known. I brought this flute, which is my lovely 14 carat Haynes with a head joint by Lafin and this is what I play in the orchestra solid gold it's very heavy solid gold yeah oh yeah. wow yeah. And, uh, but my newest flute is actually an instrument which I thought was a, a little wink in the direction of a classical flute in that it's made of wood, but with the gold keys, again, solid gold keys. So it's got a little bit more of a, a, mm. a slightly rounder, sweeter sound. But this is, this is only three years old. Yes, that's what I play in the orchestra when we play Mozart or Haydn or something ah. classical like that. On your wooden flute, the newest one, would that be normal flute? Yes, keywork? exactly. This is a modern, modern um, Boehm flute. So it's got, it, it bears very little resemblance to a classical flute other than that it's made of wood. <laughs> and so that the sound 
it just it just encourages you to think in a different way about sound, I think, than a, than a gold flute might perhaps. Bit of a mellower sound, so it doesn't need quite so much vibrato on the top. So it's in and of itself quite a beautiful sound. Mm. I'm, okay, I'm going to immediately get nerdy. Are there any? And throw you in the deep end as well. Are there any classical music sources about vibrato? Well, of course, uh, Quantz wasn't completely out of fashion on playing the flute by Joachim Quantz. I also refer back quite a lot to a book about violin playing, the, a treatise on the fundamental principles of violin playing by Papa Mozart. Ah, good old Leopold. Good, good old Leopold. And he explains lots of things about ornamentation, obviously, and a little bit about vibrato too, as Quantz mm -hmm. hints about too. Of course, there are modern sources as well. Franz Vester wrote a wonderful book about playing Mozart, mm -hmm. and he refers, he was a flute player, mm -hmm. um, and he refers a lot to flute works. Um, and a wonderful, I don't know whether you know this by Rachel Brown. So I think these, these books are really useful. They sometimes disagree with one another. And so I think like lots of things in life, maybe there's not one way and there's not one single right way. Right. Um, but what they all do agree on is that you just need to be very careful about why you're using something like vibrato. I remember as a teenage flute player trying to get further and discovering how to do a vibrato, and this was very exciting, and immediately putting it on everything because that had the feeling of, now I sound like a classical musician. <laughs> um, and then I guess you have to get through that point and then know where to put it with a bit more, exactly. a bit more style. Yeah. yeah, that's the override style is a very good word to use. When playing Mozart, I think it's just always needs to have a sort of Mozart or other, other classical composers are available. <laughs> um, um, needs to have a sort of grace and elegance and dignity you know, when you think about the, the, the costumes of the time and these huge wide dresses and so on, mm. it has to always have a kind of grace about it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But sound effortless and natural as well. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can see that in the Baroque as well. You had this sprezzatura, like sound like a virtuoso without even trying. But I think, I feel like in Baroque music, they were trying to be weird all the time. It was like, we'll be graceful and elegant, but with loads of dissonance. My stereotype about classical music is that it's all very pretty and twee, where of course it wasn't. I mean, they had dances and everything, but it, I, I think it's just, it's got a very kind of upward energy, let's say, rather than it being sort of too earthy, as a very, as a generalization, mm -hmm. I would say. And I think it comes from the grace of structure. It's called the classical era yeah. because it's referring back to ancient Greece and if you think about the temples and the structure, the design, a sort of simplicity if you like. Yeah. Um, after the highly ornamented Baroque era. So we've talked about vibrato, let's talk about articulation. I'll come in with the Baroque style, we would often use a like an alternating TD, like ta -da 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 -da, or the French ta -da 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 -da. Do you have any tips for classical articulation? I would say that in a classical style is more likely to be two and two. Tiatata, tiatata. Yeah. Tiatata, tiatata, tiatata. But then with my sort of coming from the 20th century, looking back through the Romantic um, era, I would say that for me, the most important thing is that this second note under the slur is lifted. So instead of being di ya ta ta, di ya ta ta, di ta ta, di ha ta ta. And the, the second note is really light and lifted. So, so in my head, I've just got this very sort of graceful upward energy um, yeah. to the articulation. I mean, I think it's in one of mm. his essays that Nicholas Hanenko says something like very globally, the Baroque era, we could say, is all about the bass and counterpoint above it. Mm -hmm. And then the, sec the, the classical era is about speech, rhetoric, simple elegance. And then it's only in the Romantic era that we start being led, if you like, by sound. So this, the particular sound of, of an instrument and a singing through line when you get the sort of more sustaining instrument, the bow changes shape and things start to get thicker and thicker and until you get to sort of 
Wagnerian sort of very dense writing. For a modern flute player, we don't think, because, because we've got a, a larger embouchure hole, we don't have quite the same vocabulary of, and subtle vocabulary of all the riddle diddle uh, kind yeah. of flexibility in the mouth, I think. So mm -hmm. we do tend to think of rather maybe t and d, so voiced yeah. and unvoiced. And yeah. that's sort of pretty much where it ends until you start getting to contemporary. I'm putting this together in my head with the recorder and the baroque. We're very much concerned with the start of the note. So this is your syllable, your t, d, l, r, your consonants. And what I'm hearing is that now we're actually talking about the end of the note. Yes. About I... this, this lifting and the ta, yeah. ya, ta, 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 ya, ta, ta. You're slurring them together, staccato, if you're lifting it or letting it kind of sit. For me, this realization that when articulation is actually about both sides of the note, that was like, <laughs> so structure is very important, together with the, the phrasing, very classical phrase structure, short, short, long. Um, and this is something that you're bringing out when you're playing? Well, I think that's why we need to have a kind of ta transparent texture, i.e. lifting slurs. So I always say that the golden rule of playing classical is that every slur is a kind of sense of diminuendo. So the last note under a slur will be softer or shorter or maybe a little bit of both. So while we're talking about transparency and structure, what about tempo? Ah, hmm. tempo. We can talk about tempo in terms of the speed, but we could also talk about rubato, so how much freedom we have within the tempo. I'm thinking that in classical there's going to be less freedom than in Baroque. I think it depends or, on the Baroque piece. If it yeah. was dance music, then it would be, obviously dance because yeah. they would literally that, that was their dance band there are moments like when a composer writes a, f a fermata or a cadenza moment, mm. that's your moment of freedom i guess would you say this big kind of dreamy pulling about rubato that's something for later for... definitely yeah. Yeah. yeah definitely definitely Yeah, it's 
So this was our video on how to capture and embody the style of the classical music period. Thank you so much, Emily, for being here. Thank you so much, Sarah. It's been fun. You're welcome. <laughs> Don't forget to check out Emily's YouTube channel packed with fantastic information about the flute. I'll put the link in the description. I just want to plug her Mozart CD recorded with the Concert Chabal Chamber Orchestra featuring a selection of Mozart concertos. And of course, if you happen to find yourself in Amsterdam and you can go and see the Concert Chabal Orchestra, it's, it's like a, a lifetime experience that you <laughs> should have at some point in your life. <laughs> Thanks for watching and have a great day. Bye. Bye. Bye.